David McMillan here. Who the hell am I? For decades, I ran a courier and contraband smuggling network across 50 cities, built my own equipment, created my own disguises, and used almost every device imaginable to escape detection. Retired now, I bring you the experiences of the underworld. I've met the worst and the best of 10,000 criminals and know people at a glance. You get the fine details of 40 years crossing borders, concealing goods, escaping, hiding, and becoming something else. Is this a life you could survive? Yes. Um, well, Bangkok is a big one, isn't it? Bangkok was, or Thailand was Siam. Um, and there's a country in Africa that has um, uh, changed its name. Now, what was it called? Swaziland? I don't know. But anyway, it's, um, <clears throat> they've got, oh, by the way, you know, those, uh, well, what we would call it, the looting that's going on in South Africa in the last couple of weeks, supposedly a reaction to the jailing of um, a former president or prime minister, Jacob Zuma, I think his name was. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, probably one of the uh, you know founders of this Zoom network that uh, <laughs> we're on. I don't think so. Uh, the guy could barely wear a mask properly, I think. <clears throat> but uh, do you think it's actually anything to do with that, or is just because the economy is in the toilet, um, they're using the opportunity to shop for nothing? Um. Yeah, there's always that thing, isn't there? I think yeah. there's underlying discontent in this, in what we call. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, mate. that's all right. The, my, um... my film producer, mate. So there we go. There we go. Martin Webster. Hello, Martin, for, an, for a name drop. Um, um, what does he produce? Oh, he's done two incredible films now. The first one was called The Diary of a Disgraced Soldier. Oh, yeah. OK. He was the gentleman that was uh, in Iraq filming what looked to be um, some untoward beatings of Iraqi civilians. Yeah, yeah. And then when he told his story through this documentary, you suddenly learned a completely different side to, to what, the mainstream media had put out and namely that that it wasn't some un, unwarranted right. you know, slapping around of these civilians they'd been under attack for days and days upon end they'd been shot at they'd been mm. uh, had grenades thrown over into their compound and and they faced this angry mob for days on end and finally their riot squad ran out and managed to you know so Right, I understand that. I wonder why the people were attacking them just because they didn't like, you know, Westerners in their country. Or it's hard to say, isn't it? Yeah, these things turn, don't they? They often turn. They start off with um, the, mm. West, the West being welcomed in, and then when they find out that the West's intentions or George Bush's intentions and all the cronies that own him, then. Yes, I uh, sorry, to, uh, I just thought, it, it, since we're just starting off, I should uh, say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. And I'm with Chris Thrall, who has kindly allowed me into his map room. I can see you're plotting your campaigns for the uh, the war in the East behind you. Yes. And I've you've probably seen me before on this program. And uh, my... Oh, yeah. Um, and I'm well known for blundering my way through a smuggling career of 40 years and being jailed in various hideous places from which I escaped or otherwise wriggled out. So I'm alive today. And um, we had a good time last time we spoke, didn't we? We had an absolutely wonderful chat, David. And it's, it's always nice to or rewarding to meet someone who's been out there a bit and done a few things. I know what you mean. Sometimes, uh, and I'm guilty of this, I'll, I'll make um, the wrong assumption that somebody is a, is a little familiar with the areas that I'm talking about. Whereas 
I know with you, certainly, uh, with your, uh, you know, what would you call it, wild rides up and down in a, in a, in a series of ongoing highs and lows, um, that a lot of things are familiar to you that, uh, uh, you know, it makes things easier. I tell you, I, I did want your opinion on this. You've probably seen the story over the last year or so of, now what would you call him? His name was Carlos uh, Gusson, hard to pronounce because it's spelled G-O, G-H-O-S-N or something. Anyway, he was the boss of Nissan Mitsubishi, having come from Renault. Very high-flying executive, not just well-paid, but well-respected, having brought Renault from the brink of bankruptcy. Anyway, he was arrested in Japan by Japanese authorities um, over his personal finances and how he used the money from the company. Oh, fine. A bit puzzling why they got involved. But he was held in a Japanese prison. And as you know, that is not a, a fun ride in there. Uh, okay, there's nothing so bad about a, a mat on the ground, is there, Chris? I mean, it's actually quite good for the back, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but he um, escaped from Japan. He was bailed out eventually on a one trillion yen bail ticket, which is kind of pricey, isn't it? Um, and he put up Nissan shares for that, by the way. Um, and it was a, a US special uh, ex-services guy called Taylor, I think his name was, who got him out or organized the plan anyway. And um, you're all familiar with the story? I'm going to be honest, David. I, I, I stopped watching the mainstream media after, um, can we say, the events in New York back along. Um, well, way back at 9-11. Yeah, I think when... That's, that's, that's really bowing out from uh, uh, the mainstream. I mean, I look, I can understand the point, but what did you, and I guess there's nothing that's happened that would make you feel otherwise, think that the uh, mainstream news was too uh, manipulated or you know, getting top-down editorial affecting everything? Yes, I would probably hazard a guess. Mm. This is just a rough putting it out. There's probably 300 people can control what goes on on this planet. Um, yeah, what's that big conference in, usually happens in Switzerland? Bilderberg. That's it, yeah. It's spooky, isn't it? You kind of get this uh, old-fashioned whiff of sulfur about it um, where there's some dark secret cabal is going on, you know, a, a kind of modern-day Illuminati where uh, they're, uh, they're, they're... You know, I often like to think, okay... I only wish that the world was controlled by people who knew what they were doing. And had the ability, even if I didn't agree with their cunning plans, you, there'd be some satisfaction, don't you think, that somebody somewhere at least knew what the hell he was doing. Um, but uh, no, I can, I can see how, anyway, it was a very jumbled story, but he was taken out of Japan by private jet, but to get on it, since his house was monitored by private detectives hired by Nissan, he was concealed. Um, he went. He was allowed to go to the Hyatt Hotel for his meals. He went down there, got, um, and then was transferred into a big box. And the big box was the kind that's for concerts where they hold um, subwoofers, massive speakers, yeah. and then loaded uh, onto the private jet, a Turkish company. Uh, flown to Istanbul, then on to change planes there while not clearing through uh, immigration in Istanbul. Um, and he already held, I think, French, Brazilian and Lebanese passports, but I think a couple of those had been surrendered. But one thing about passports, you can always get another. Uh, you know, the British have been actually quite good about that. I've never had them say, no, you can't have another passport. Um, the police are holding yours. They they'll knock you one out, um, and you know, just say, look, if you're planning on absconding from something, don't tell us about it. Um, 
you know, people get ridiculously pally, don't they? They make eye contact with somebody and then reveal the whole plan. I don't know why that is with people. Now, so he got back there. It, so it's a happy ending. He's in Lebanon. But uh, kind of everybody else got arrested. The pilots got arrested, sent to jail in Turkey for a uh, uh, well, technical breach of the immigration rules. The two American Special Forces guy, well, he was really one, this Michael Taylor. He'd grown up on army bases. His um, adoptee dad was uh, quite high in the military, and he was a bit of a uh, an early starter um, and had a private security company in Afghanistan. Mind you, like a lot of those guys, um, when they were used up by the, the government, they turned on him. Actually did 19 months over some supposed misrepresentation of his contract. But it was better to do the plea deal, uh, which a lot of people find. You know, they, they get into a situation and, and some prosecutors will say, well, you've already been in nine months. Uh, we'll give you 12 months and you'll be out you know, in two or three months. And otherwise, you'll be bogged down in the courts for years. Who knows what we'll come up with? Um, it'd be very tempting to um, plead guilty to it. But if, if you were tasked with um, getting somebody out of Japan, now, you don't actually have to break him out of the prison. That's a good thing. But um, you've got to sneak him by. What would you be thinking by sea, by air? What, what comes to mind with your experience? I guess one thing is getting somebody out of the country. We had this situation in Hong Kong when I was there. One of the guys oh. I knew got busted with a big bag of ice. Oh. Um, by ice, I don't mean diamonds. I mean no, uh, no. Crystal, <laughs> crystal meth. And he was fake. I mean, you you know yourself, Dave. You, you, you don't want to spend any time in an Asian prison, let alone somewhere like China. No, I mean, where did he get busted? He, it was in Hong Kong, was it? He went to drop off a, a, a delivery, only a small, it would have been a bit of per, personal stuff to somebody right. in a bar, and it, they turned out to be um, drug squad. Oh, great. Mm. Uh, at this time, to show you the level of seriousness and also the kind of confused um, Chinese mentality, at that time, they busted a kid, so a youngster in a nightclub, who had one ecstasy pill on him, as you know, many people did back in the day. The judge yeah. gave him 12 years. Well, for a, one tab? For or... one pill. Yeah. At, at the appeal hearing, they had to explain to the judge that, you know, it's ecstasy, it's what most young people or a significant percentage of young people are doing at the moment. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not big. Mm. And, um, and he had his sentence reduced. But I spoke to one of my triad friends and just mm. said look can you help this guy and the triad sent one of their um, foot soldiers a guy I don't, I don't know how high up in the chain he he was but obviously a mm. guy that could get stuff done he came to meet me uh in a nightclub yeah right. um with a view to discussing how, you know, the possibility of getting this guy out of the country. Mm. And the guy, the guy got so drunk, he just ended up with his head <laughs> <laughs> on, on the table. And um, so the, the, the plan didn't develop very well that evening. No, but... it, it, it didn't. They didn't have a, a, a high, pro is it the word propensity for alcohol? No, no. And some people are uh, kind of, I think that's, um, there seems to be some genetic link there, doesn't there? Yes, yes. Um, Northern European uh, genetics seem to take it okay. Um, but the more towards the tropics you get, um, the less capacity to uh, take it on. In fact, it's, uh, I think, a really some. When I was living in Australia, the um, uh, people who were indigenous Australians um, really couldn't, had it just took over their lives um, and, and, and ruinously so. Um, I guess really, you know, the, it's, it's the old and yet simple thing. 
whoever's left standing in the room alive has for whatever reason um, um, been developed to cope with whatever's around, uh, the, the poisons, intoxicants, the conditions, the weather, everything else. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking perhaps where people uh, were in a relatively protected environment, you know, where the tropics, you don't have the extremes of weather. Um, it's not exactly so you can pluck uh, bananas and coconuts from the trees and don't have to do any intense farming, but um, you don't get exposed to a lot of different things. There, there's no reason for the genetic line to you know, put up a, a big coping mechanism with it. But these tribes, do you think, from my experience with them, they, um, the, the Chinese uh, have been more inclined to do things by underground agreement. That is, uh, you get a passport through them, it's fixed on the computer. I was very lucky in Bangkok. I mean, you can imagine, as we know with escapes, the where they fail is after the person's out more often than not. And um, it's just my guard dogs attacking some. Um, the I was out and then groping around the back of somebody's bathroom mirror for a promised envelope which would have the passport in it. And that was a lot of promising. You know, people promise you lots in life, don't they, Chris? <laughs> Do they deliver? Really, indeed. So I was well pleased to have the thing in my hand, but flipping through it um, and then approaching the immigration desk, I thought, well, I know here that this was a British passport, freshly stolen about three weeks ago, I guess, my picture in it. But... Um, but it had the little slip of paper that you, in those days you got when you went into the country. I thought, well, gee, if this is not on the computer that I see this guy tapping everybody through, I'm screwed. Did my Chinese underground friends take the trouble to go down and talk to the guy who does their fixes at the airport, open up the computer, bang it in, as a, as a genuine entry into the country. And of course, by the time I'm actually standing in front of him, I've convinced myself this is wildly improbable that they would have gone to this extra mile. So I was a bit glazed over and didn't like the furrowed brow on his head as he clicked another couple of keys. And as I stopped breathing, luckily the stamp of freedom was applied to the passport and I went on. Um, they, the Chinese, are, in my experience, have always been very reliable once you kind of penetrate that barrier. And I guess we have to make ourselves useful to people, don't we? You know, if you and I go someplace, say we head off to, I don't know, someplace which is fraught with peril, like Iran or something, and we've got some pretext for being there, which I don't know what would be. But we, to survive, we have to make ourselves more useful, alive, breathing, and functioning than left open to be used as a pawn. Because I think, and, and from what I've read from your books, um, it wouldn't be the first time that somebody has decided that, hmm, ah, I think, uh, who shapes up for this fall? Yeah, Chris, Chris will work its way in there. You know, we just color the story around the edges and, you know, it'll, it'll be a drowning man within minutes. And that's the thing, if you don't, um, on balance, make yourself more useful doing what you do, then you're at terrible risk, don't you think? Asia is incredibly efficient, right? Mm. It, it remind me of a story. I was in, uh, God, was I in Thailand? Yeah, I traveled from Thailand into Cambodia right. and I wanted to go up into Laos or Laos. Mm. And when I got over the border into Cambodia, uh, I'm not sure if it's Phnom Penh. Yeah, that's the capital. Where it? It, no, it was a it was a it was a town in with, Cambodia, I mean. Mm. Yeah, it was it was one of the first towns <clears> you get to. I can't but Siem Siem Reap. Oh yes, that's where right. they have yeah. the mad magnificent monument. Yeah. And I went into the, the 
travel agent and I said, can I get a visa for, um, for Lao? Right. And I was going to travel through Lao uh, or v- Vietnam and I was going to travel up through Vietnam into Lao and then back. What, what year are we talking about here? This roughly? is about <clears throat> 15 years ago now, some, something okay. like that. And I handed my passport to, to the girl in the, the travel agent and I got on the bus and I crossed the border. Uh, sorry, I got on the bus from Siem Reap to go to Phnom Penh or the mm-hmm. cup truck or whatever it was. And then it suddenly occurred to me, I hadn't given them a photograph for the visa. I just All completely right. forgot. And so I sat on this journey, panicking as you do, mm-hmm. because I had to get into Laos. The, I was a... I, had, I think I had an outbound ticket back from Bangkok in a few days' time, whatever. I had to make this trip. Uh, but this, I, can I ask, this visa would have been either <clears throat> a, a stamp in your passport or a separate piece of paper or yeah, a like computer when they, somewhere. when they clip the paper into your passport. Okay. So it was there, was it? But there was no picture on it. Well, here's the thing. I, I got to Phnom Penh. And I'm, you know, when you travel and you, I don't need to tell you this, these, these mm. little things that you're, you really can get worried are going to screw every, I mean, I haven't, I've, I've got, mm. I'm mm. going into Vietnam. I've got all this stuff planned. And I, anyway, I walked into the travel agent in Phnom Penh. And as I put my hand on the, the door handle and there's mm. a glass door like they have over there, yeah. I saw the girl at a back desk go, and she reached in a drawer immediately. And even by the time I'd got in the door, she had her passport and was waving it at me. All right. And I said, photo. She went, and she showed me, this is going to sound really uh, silly to modern people who are used to technology and, and you can just no. send a picture on your phone like that. We didn't have that back then. No, no, no. There's my photo. Right. Yeah. They just had the foresight to scan the passport photo and use that. Ah, oh, that's great. Yeah. And, yeah that and, was a relief. And just to reiterate why why this isn't as insignificant as it sounds is had I been in an English travel agent, mm. they would no way have had the initiative to scan the one on no, the passport. No, no. I would have just got to the place and they'd say, sorry, sir, there's a pro- <clears> problem <throat> with your visa. I'd mm. like to phone a travel agent and they say, sorry, sir, you, you, you forgot to give us your photograph, you know, but no, in Asia, so efficient. Mm. They just went, right, scan that. And I think you're right. Uh, <clears throat> the people, and also we, we have to bear in mind that um, travel agencies are really, you know, died over here because people don't need their services. They're online and they do their Expedia bookings or whatever. But you know, in, in Asia, when somebody goes to people who organize things, whether it be for visas, employment, uh, jobs in another country, they put themselves in their hands. And they, a, a lot of the people, their clients, don't know anything from filling in forms. They don't know. They just leave it with them. And they get used to um, dealing with all of it. Um, and usually do a pretty good job because the um, they know it, it, a bit like the <clears throat> if we even go down a, a level of um, uh, where things even get rougher. Uh, I know around the court buildings in streets in uh, New Delhi or um, Mumbai uh, or even in uh, Kabul, you would find kind of scribe street, and there'd be little guys, sometimes women, by um typewriters and a little card table in the street and people would be lined up to go to them to do everything any submission they needed to make to the court any representation any um comprehension of documents that that they'd be giving and these people earned a living by knowing what people's likely problems were and i know i'm sure they wouldn't sit there explaining the details of how I don't know, some government department actually works. They just say, oh, we know what you want. We know what you need to do. Now, you'll get programs like um, those border crossing TV reality shows. And 
some poor schmuck from uh, Asia's saying, oh, well, look, I don't know, the travel agent worked it all out for me. And, and they're scoffing at that, saying, oh, yes, 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 yeah, a likely story. Go and blame the travel agent. But, you know, the statement here is that you never work such and such. But in a way, it's true. Um, they would go to a travel agency and whatever was required to say, the agency would know that and write it in. There used to be a little trap about a million years ago with US visas. <clears throat> if you wrote on the application, it, the question was, um, how long have you um, lived in the UK? If, let's just say you, you said you were born here. <clears throat> Now, a lot of people would write, uh, well, let's see, I'm uh, 54 now, so I guess I've been here 54 years, and they'd write that in. Eh. No, that was a fail. Um, you had to use the phrase all of life, because if it was a, a number, 54 years, it would get flagged by the processing as we want to know where he was before then. Even though if they looked at the date of birth, they should realize, well, in the womb. I mean, I didn't get a visa while I was in the womb, but, you know, they, they let me go on that one. Um, <clears throat> and there's a lot of little bits of crap, as, as, as you were saying with your uh, border crossing there, um, that you know how things can deteriorate for um, no really sensible reason on, on some tiny bit of rubbish because we've been through it before. Everything else has worked out in great detail. And then <clears throat> on some part of the day, you simply have to go there and come back for something, but you don't get back because um, they put you on a different flight and that meant you arrived at the wrong terminal and you had to go through some processing between the ter two terminals and that meant somebody else's nose was on you and they wanted to know all about your business and you weren't expecting to be having to explain about all your business at that point so <clears throat> you know I, I had the same thing <clears throat> all, all the cargo was safe it was backpacked in the UK ready to go back to Australia my only little problem was because of my travels I ended my Australian passport didn't have an entry stamp for the UK. So I said, to, I was staying at the Portobello Hotel in um, London. A nice uh, kind of stylish kind of boutique hotel before they were uh, popular. A lot of drunken musicians up and down the corridors. Anyway, I said to Chloe, hey, look, I'm going to whip over to Paris this morning, right? I'm going to go over on... It was a glorious piece of documentation, Chris. I think you're too young to remember them, but they were called a British visitor's passport. They're a piece of cardboard you bought from the post office for, uh, I forget what, like 10 pounds or something. And it was good for the EEC countries in those days. Your photo was well, stapled or with a fancy looking rivet gun thing to the, and it had a couple of red stamps on it. But the good thing about it was when customs saw it, they you know, I just been to Europe, this idiot, and waved you on. <clears throat> so I said, well, I'm going to go to Paris on the cardboard job from the post office, turn around at Charles de Gaulle, take the next flight back, and get the entry stamp with the Australian one. So when I leave later on, you know, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, she said, Are you going to take some luggage? Well, it's... I'll take a bag, but I'm really just so I'm not wandering around with nothing in my hand. And I, I grabbed something or other and emptied it and put a towel in there and a shaving kit and jumped on the plane. Now, <clears throat> so this is a routine bit of housekeeping. Nothing should go wrong, right? <laughs> I go to Paris, fine with that, um, jump back on another plane, arrive produce Australian passport, stamped in, good, I've got that. Stick that down my trousers and um, walk on through. Now, I'm not carrying anything, so I'm not really thinking of anything except where I'm going to have lunch and uh, stuff like that. I get to what was your, Terminal 2 at Heathrow, normally pretty good in those days. In fact, it was a ghost town. Ah, perfect. Um, but there was one customs officer there. Now, 
Tell me what you think of this guy from a distance. Customs officers, yeah, white shirt, uniform, usually he's standing around talking to a colleague or whatever. This one by himself, tall, long hair. Yeah. Now, well, we're talking about 1980s, I guess, but um, very early 1980s, no, 79 or something. So there was a kind of fashion thing where even officials would have slightly longer hair. But to my mind, um, they're the kind of official who wants to be a little bit rebellious within this group, don't you think? I mean, did you ever have anybody who pushed the, um, the appearance code in the services kind of to the edge? Yeah, like all of us. <laughs> yeah, but one of the characteristics of that um, thing is that so that the guy, I guess, with the long hair is not considered useless at his job, he actually makes a point of being rather efficient at his job. So he kind of dives on me. Uh, where have you been? Paris. Oh, yeah. Uh, where's the ticket? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, here's the problem. My ticket is in a different name going over there, so I can't produce that one. So I, I whip out a passport, but make the I don't give him the cardboard one. In a, in a stupid kind of, well, this is the last thing I used. I should show it. I've given him the Australian one, and he's gone to town on that. Didn't like it. There were Thailand stamps in it. Oh, come over here. <clears throat> I think, oh, well, this is taking time. Well, I, oh, I should be out of here soon. Um, <clears throat> the bag I've picked up carelessly at the hotel was one I've been traveling around, just a, what, in-flight uh, soft carry bag. Hadn't paid any attention to it for months. Down in the corner of the front zip pocket was a little bit of hash. They'd been floating around in there, wanting to be smoked and neglected carelessly by all of us for all these months. And there it was. He pulled it out. And I knew at that moment, Chris, that my day was not going to be pleasant because I'm standing there. I've got another passport down my trousers in a different name. And uh, they're going to take me and give me a strip search and find that and get onto the airline's ticketing computers and look at all my movements and draw their own conclusions. So, yes, it was a small bit of administrative travel, you could say, that I didn't give proper care and attention to because I was dismissive. There were no kilos of A-class drugs. There was no plutonium. There was no you know, gold shipment. There was nothing that you would normally focus your mind on. Um, I just needed a rotten bit of stamp in my uh, passport. Uh, it was... Um, it's always the small things that trip you up. It's oh, the, yeah. I mean... I, I, I didn't get out of there until... Um, I didn't get out of there at all. It was midnight by the time... Um, um, they've gone to... They've checked the airline and they see that me and my girl are travelling out that night going back to Australia and... and um, they want to know what we've been up to. But she was a bit of a smart cookie, old Clelia. When she was dragged in, she was under a phony passport or was checked out. She was in a position to say, oh, I only met the guy in my travels in Thailand. Yeah, good time, Charlie. That's all he was to me, nothing. Yeah, but you know, what... Uh, what and she said, well, why all these different passports? What's it? I don't know, but... He did have a couple of big suitcases with him, and then somebody came in Thailand and, and picked them up, and he was all relaxed after that. And they're saying, damn, we've missed it. It's headed off in another direction. So she was, I, she was, she was good like that. And <clears throat> um, I <clears throat> uh, came the wash up. Um, she was going to be nicked for having snotted a female customs officer because she took objection to being strip searched and supposedly flushed something down the, the, the loo, which was where the, she was taken uh, for that. But um, I said, look, I'll, uh, I'll plead to the bit of hash. I'll accept that. And in return, you let the girl go. And she doesn't know anything. She's just an idiot. Oh, well, that's no way to talk about it. All right, we'll go for that. 
Um, now, there's one fly in the ointment here. Um, as they pounced on her, where she's staying, she's staying uh, at the hotel, but at the time she'd put her telephone number with some friends of ours. <laughs> now, friends of ours, don't, they don't always tell you back, their background, do they, Chris? I mean, you ask somebody who's coming on something, you clean? You got anything I should worry about? Something I need to know about? Any mischief? I don't care, mind. You can... Pull a, you can, you know, be a cannibal for all I care. I just need to know in case, you know. No, no, I'm good. Yeah, fine. That like shit. Turns out they've got, um, you know, uh, I'm sure it happened to some colleagues of yours. Turns out they'd been uh, arrested in bar fights in uh, Phuket. You know, they'd uh, been forced marched out of Japan for disgracing themselves. Or, you know, there's still some uh, prostitute who wants some money in Amsterdam that's put in a case against him. You know, these things come up. Now, the, the people where she was staying, huh, they had a past indeed, so they they were up to a lot of mischief, nothing that day. But what it meant was the cargo had come back into the Heathrow airport because it was in my luggage bags and her luggage bags. Uh, but they couldn't find it. When they opened it up, it was just a machine. Um, and they, like a stereo player, and very well made, they, 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 you had to smash the thing to ribbons to find anything inside. But, you know, I'm still looking at a 20-year sentence under that. Now, everybody's happy with me taking the plea, letting the girl go, calling it a night. They've called out some guys wearing a bow tie. It was at the opera because the case looked like it was going to lead to something big. What with the, the Fulham Road connection with the people there and the multiple passports. Um, and but they're calling it on letting me go. Long hair, the customs guy, doesn't like it. He's tapping this radio case thing, saying, Wait, yeah, no, nah, no, nah, it doesn't. Well, what would he be so concerned that he actually wanted to make sure he had the right exit stamps? Something was still yet to happen of significance. And I've dismissed all that with, um, No, no, I just uh, didn't want to have to explain. Uh, why I you know, changed passports during travel, because they don't like you doing that. Um, anyway, he, his senior, thought, no, look, long hair. We're calling it a night. Let him go. The girl goes and said to me, well, you're going to take all this luggage with you to uh, the jail, you know. You know we're we're going to oppose bail because you had different passports. Hmm? Oh, no, I'll give it all to the girl. I mean, gee, she's had a hard time. I've dragged her through the mud, you know. All right, yeah, that'll do. So she's gone off with that. She's got the cargo back. <laughs> and uh, long hair doesn't like it. Um, and they've all gone to sleep on it. The next day, um, I'm in Brixton thinking, well, could have been worse. I'm going to um, have to plead to one of the passports, but I think I can wriggle out of that because it wasn't a British one. And... Um, yeah, okay, so a bit of hash, what's the worst that could happen in a few months? At Brixton in those days was a riot. You know, you could still, prisoners could still have um, one can of beer a day if they were on remand, and uh, they had visits uh, every day on remand. It was, the, the visit centre was a, a riot of uh, exchanging of cargo and bits and things and numbers, and of course it was before phones and all of that. So all the messages for the, you could see the big villains table, they're all chunky sized and all lined up with their villains wives coming in, doled up to the max because you, your villain in those days didn't like the missus looking like a, a bit of trailer trash. So they were there, there. And through this carnival, oh, and on the other side was sort of the broken wrecks. Um, through all this noise, uh, clearly I said, well, at least you got the cargo back. I mean, you put that somewhere safe. Um, not exactly. Uh, when I got back, I told our friend, what, well, the people who used to be in the business are no longer the ones whose reputation causes most of this headache. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I told him that uh, it was there. I thought, you know, I owe it to him to it. You are to nobody to reveal something, saying nothing. God, how many times have I said to everyone, saying nothing and wait and see what happens. This will pay off, I promise you. <laughs> St. Peter at the gates of heaven will welcome you, saying, welcome, friend, because you said nothing. <laughs> and uh, the guy in Fulham 
panicked over um, all of this, broke up the container, had a, had a put a couple of bits of it up his nose, and then um, said, oh, I've got to get it out of the house in a frenzy, ran down, th threw it in a, um, a tip or a dumpster or something or other, because the next day was rubbish day. Um, and, um, and that was it, but it wasn't quite it, because I said, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. So let me get this clear. It's all been opened up, it's everywhere. You know, the, the marching powder and the other stuff from Thailand is, is all a mess. No, 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 they couldn't get to, he couldn't get to the inner container. He only got to a little one for his personal use. And all right, all right, all right. And this is in a rubbish bin somewhere. So I gave him a number. Now, I, I gave Clelia, I mean, I gave her a number. And this would be a bit like a number, I don't know, if we'd known each other before, it, can you imagine um, being woken up by um, some young girl who said, look, I'm David's latest or next or dearest. Uh, he gave me your number because there's a little bit of a problem. And you'd probably say, well, let me have a coffee and uh, I'll do some listening. And she explains that um, uh, I'm locked up. The stuff has been thrown in a, in a rubbish bin, which may or may not have been collected. Um, and uh, it needs to be retrieved and she needs to be put somewhere and stuck back on a plane and, and, and got out of the country. And he'll be eternally grateful and he'll be rewarded uh, suitably. And you think, yeah, I've heard that before. Well, um, but that's what I did. And this guy, Robert, um, uh, went with her and headed down to where the, the rubbish was. Uh, well, it was before wheelie bins, but it was all piled up. It was piled up, except it had been cleared. Now, they, uh, the girl and my friend Robert, the, the capable person, we'll call him, with a cap similar to yours, um, arrived in time to see my friend from Fulham having woken up with a clear head and think, oh my God, I've just thrown out like 100,000 pounds worth of stuff. Am I mad? So he's got himself a little gunny sack and running down the street after it. Uh, my girl and, and Robert are after it, but they're not alone. The customs have all had a good night to sleep on this and decided, wait a minute, we mad, we've handed over the stuff. They've gone down to get it. Um, but um, <clears throat> fortunately, um, Robert was uh, quite good at knowing what to do in those situations. Um, he caused enough racket on a street corner so that the, the customs people spotted Mr. Fulham and thought, aha, now we're at it. They got busy with each other. Meanwhile, Robert went down there and the bin was empty, so he went straight to the, um, the dump and actually found it. I mean, how, you know, found it within a very short space of time. And it was still in its uh, plastic sealed containers with con Allen keys that had been buried under um, resin. Um, took that, uh, buried it somewhere else, um, because I, I told him, look, it's uh, weatherproof and all of that, um, and got her back on a plane and all was well. Um, uh, well, well, <laughs> except they built a car park over the thing uh, where he buried it sometime later, but that was a, that's another story. But it, it does go to illustrate where did all this started? Where did this night of terror and me in a magistrate court getting six months for a, a bit of hash and a couple of iffy documents. Um, it started simply because I was crossing a border doing nothing, I thought. But in fact, as we all know, it's when you think you're doing nothing and no harm done, that's when you get into trouble. And don't you find that, you know, if you look back on your own things. Yes, was, yes. When you get lackadaisical, yeah. Well, it, it's, I think, too, I've been in situations where, you know, you know, you've probably had friends who, I don't know, and this particularly applies to uh, weed, marijuana, they'll feel it should all be legalized. Fine, uh, who disagrees with that? Nobody. But um, 
because of that, they get particularly uh, brave and foolish because it's almost like they're challenging the world to go and arrest me. You're doing something wrong. You know, I, I should be able to do this thing. And you'll say to them, well, yeah, didn't we agree that the following precautions were going to be done? Yeah, yeah, but it was a bit of weed in the end. A bit of weed and we can still go to the, you know, Bowery place with the keys and all of that. Um, and, it, and people's sense of what's right and wrong uh, really interferes with their judgment over, um, I mean, say you and I are going to, um, I don't know, Kazakhstan or uh, Belarus. <laughs> um, we're going to take into account the fact that um, right and wrong, uh, what we think is good and bad in the world, has got nothing to do with anything. What we've got to decide is how they operate, how they play their game there. What it is that, um, I mean, we'd, we'd find somebody local that wasn't a troublemaker, didn't have a cause or an extra grind, but just knew his or her way through the, the minefield of living in a totalitarian state. Um, and look at that kid who got uh, snatched off a plane, um, who fell to pieces. I mean, what a wimp. Um, he was saying sorry the next day. What was his name now? Is it Romeo? Rotunda? Or something? Anyway, I forget it. But he, um, it, it was a bit uh, over the dinner, effectively hijacking the plane, demanding it come down because of a bogus bomb threat, wasn't it? And then um, there were already some um, uh, KGB types on, on board who sort of disappeared. Um, and then they, they grabbed this uh, kid. Uh, and he was a, a, a blogger, but it's, it's all very well for him to sit in his uh, studio flat, uh, mouthing off to his cell phone. Um, and in a place, well, he, he wasn't in the place which had caused him. He wasn't in Belarus at the time, I think. Um, but of course, he, he's poked his thumb and nose at them and he probably thought well I'm perfectly safe there's nothing they can do in a way it's a, a lesson to all you know all people who think oh I, I'm immune from all this uh, you know I, I'm young and cocky and uh, nothing can happen to me of course it wasn't a it was an overdone thing for somebody well, what is he? he's just a mouth why should the why should the leader of the, that country care one way or another? Um, but probably when the opportunity came up, I guess some spook must have said, look, you know that flight that he's going on next week, it overflies our country. So uh, here's our opportunity. Um, and whatever happens to last week's outrage anyway, Chris, I mean, you know, people saying, oh, well, there'll be sanctions over this. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, let's put, and in fact, let's apply them to the individuals in the state control of, of wherever it might be. They don't care. So their wife has to go shopping in Paris instead of them. You know, it, it doesn't doesn't mean anything. Of course, because as much as the government might leap to um, their defence and say, "Oh, this or that." Uh, Take the case of that um, the woman uh, Zagari, is it Radcliffe Zagari? She's uh, the her husband's British. He must be the Radcliffe part, and she's Iranian-born, so she has dual citizenship. I think she's still there, isn't she? She's been held what over five years, something like that. Yeah, what was she held for? It was something. Well, you know, maybe something gets lost in translation with the Iranian, but the Persian crime was um, a spreading disinformation in the employ of a foreign agent or something to that effect. A mm. uh, kind of low-level spying. Um, not, uh, And Boris, he wasn't a PM in those days when she was first arrested, but... Um, he made it worse by not even taking the trouble to read from the foreign office what it was she was doing there. She was seeing family or something. Um, and she had a young daughter. Um, 
he said that she was he seemed to think it was she was a teacher and um oh well why shouldn't a woman be able to um, teach children about freedom oh shut up you idiot so he, he's buried her um uh, he's a careless kind of politician isn't he he's quite a gambler don't you think he, he he's opened up um from a kind of semi-bogus freedom day thinking that okay a lot of cases not a lot of deaths He's made a friend in old Cummings, hasn't he? What a traitor that guy is, huh? <laughs> He's a right-hand man. Well, the funny thing is about these individuals, they are so far from enlightenment, David. And enlightenment is everything. It, it's the only thing to live for, to, be, to understand your place in this incredible universe mm. to want, and to want for nothing except to just breathe fresh air. These individuals, they live toxic lifestyles. I mean, they literally fuel their body with the alcohol, lavish. No, that's lav true. And not just alcohol, but over fatty food. Yeah. And they're, uh, they're all sexual perverts, or most of them are, <laughs> because they've been through the public school system, so they've been getting... Buggered up. and beaten from an early age, yes. Yeah, they've been getting touched up since they were nine years, you know, not, well, probably six years old. And th this just, if you don't work through these things, which those individuals haven't, because if they had, they wouldn't be doing the job. They would have to leave that job behind because it's so toxic. Yeah, yeah. And here's the irony. We don't just recognize the, these incredibly toxic individuals, but we we vote for. Or, well, I don't. I've never voted, but the 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 can we say the naive public mm. go and go to the polls every four years or whatever it is and vote these sociopathic losers in again under the mistaken belief that that they actually like care about you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, not knowing yeah. that they serve one function, and that's to protect the um, the 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 power hold, the stronghold. The Sir Humphreys uh, in the in the uh, the mandarins yeah, of government. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, but I've got one for you, David. Um, mm. Tell me what you think of this. My uncle. Um, he's no longer with us now. He lived a life. Uh, to excess, you could say. Right. Um, a role model, you might say. <laughs> uh, just, you know, if you, you do that stuff, if you live a rock and roll life, you are going to die young. You've got to learn to rein it in at some point, right? Well, yes, if you want to be able to sit back and relax, but I, I can't argue with somebody who goes out in a blaze of glory. How, yeah. What happened with your uncle? Well... It wasn't a blaze of glory. It was incredibly sad, like like obesity, mm. diabetes, alcoholism, oh. um, all, all of that sort of stuff. But anyway, he found a new life for himself in Phuket. Okay. Having, having been a small scale kind of um, a dealer in this country. Um, and anyway, I don't need to sort of go into his story too much, but he came home to the UK once and he brought his, his Thai wife, wife with him. We're at my, my late mother's house. And we're, Chris, you want to roll a joint? And he thrust at me this tub, like the yeah. sort of tub you have nutritional pills in with, with a peel off, the white yeah, one okay. with a peel off lid. And he thrust me this tub. It was, you know, about so big. Um, if you listen on iTunes, we're talking like four, 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 five, five inches high. Okay. And um, I peeled off that it's full of weed, Thai, wow. Thai, Thai weed, right? And I said to him, how the hell? Because, you know, it, it, for, for friends at home, it's the death penalty in Thailand, probably still to this day, but it mm. always was for any kind of trafficking of narcotics. So yes, if you get caught at the airport, the penalties are very yeah, much different and, from anywhere yes. else. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I said, how did you bring, I mean, uh, I expected him to say, oh, I had it 
hidden in my suitcase or had it down my pants or something like he went oh just had it in my pocket i'm like okay is that does that technique work <laughs> and yeah, I've, been, yeah. I've been through a few airports i know it's yeah, yeah. and he said well i got to the uh the the customs but uh, the the security check bit and the wo- woman in thailand pulled me to one side and said as they do sir can i have a, can i have a word with you mm. and she said could you empty your pockets he says so i just emptied everything into the the tray she picked up this pot, mm. peeled the lid off, looked in and went, hmm, put the lid on, handed it back to me. <laughs> so, um, do, what do you make of that? Now, what was what was your uncle's opinion that she knew what was in it, but just couldn't be stuffed going on with it? Or you know, she thought it, this was this conversation was about 15, if not 20, about 15 years ago now. So I, I honestly can't remember. But mm-hmm. I ha- I don't know if she thought it was herbs. She just didn't know. I, I mean, I'm sure being in that job, you know what what we I was just I, thinking of the smell, but that aside, OK, it could have been. The thing going in his favor, I, I knew somebody once who um, was on a kind of did a suicide run, you could say, from uh, Costa Rica. Uh, and I, I said, Well, where did you have it? Uh, did you get somebody to pack it or did you just? No, no I just rolled it up uh, a kilo of coke in my jeans and threw them in a the suitcase, and that was it. It got through. Nobody even checked it. But in, in this situation, because your uncle didn't make any attempt to conceal it. He didn't get nervous when it was produced. It was sitting there on the tray with a whole lot of other stuff. Now, the the woman who was checking it was security, wasn't she? That was her job, making sure there's no bombs on board or weapons. So uh, she wasn't customs, um, and she she wasn't particularly you know a narcotics person as such, though. As you say, working there, you you know all about it. Um, I I suppose we've only got two ways of going on it. Either she's uh, okay. Even if it was pressed, squashed in to this um, economy multivitamin size pill container, it's was still by weight that would be probably around. 300, 350 grams tops, I guess, because even if you squash it, it's still quite light. But it's not in her hands a bomb, not um, you know, sulfuric acid or something like that. So it hasn't triggered any of the things she's you know, programmed in to respond to. And the fact that here it is, your uncle is not saying, oh, oh I can explain that or whatever. Um, but Oh, by the way, when you, you keep saying you peeled off the, the inner seal, in the beginning, had he glued that on, that inner seal? I'm guessing so. Um, so if he'd done that and she and she peeled it off, uh, then, yeah, whatever it was. Um, <laughs> I mean, do you recall what the label was? I mean, if it said something no. like... Uh, long time ago but it, whatever the label was no doubt didn't match in any way what, what i like to think like. i like to think it was like the time i was working in a supermarket in norway and i'm sat on the checkout and with the cameras that uh, we had the tv screens for the cameras and there were only two mm. in the shop and generally speaking scandinavians are the most honest people on the planet you could you know, if you drop your wallet on the pavement mm. and you return the next day to go and pick it up, someone will be stood there and they'll say, you know, it's very inconsiderate of you to drop your wallet <laughs> in the middle of the pavement. Somebody could fall over that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's good. I, I like that. I mean, um, I thought you were going to say, um, uh, you know, we're, we're waiting for you to come back for a while, but he's gone the extra bit. You know, you're making a public nuisance of yourself, <laughs> leaving money where anybody could slip on it. But yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in this supermarket and I'm, I'm sat on a till, and a guy comes in and he's got a bag over his shoulder, 
And I just looked up at the camera and I saw him. I looked up at the TV screen and I saw him go to the back of the shop where all the beer was. Yeah. And he went, grabbed right. two, um, I don't know, they were like three or three litre bottles of beer or so, two litre bottles, put them in his bag. And then he, he made a beeline out. And as he, uh, <laughs> right. as he came past me, I, I said something like, I mean, did he buy anything at all to at least? No, no, no. He, he made, he made a bee, beeline out. Yeah. And as he passed me, I said, drink it all? <laughs> me, I said, do you, you like, you, you drink beer? Or I said, do you, do you like oh, right. li- yeah. liquor do all? Do, oh, yeah. do you like beer? And he went. I wasn't, I wasn't. Um, it, well, you know, yeah, supermarkets yeah. Can, can take a bit of a hit, I'm sure. But, yeah. Uh, anyway, it was probably either. Um, well, he, I, if he was wealthy enough so he could buy it without, you know, it affecting the rest of his day, he probably would have paid for it because he, from what you say, he sounds a bit nervous, and so this was not something perhaps he did routinely. But it, I understand what you mean. It, uh, even is, you know, a job like that, you're thinking, well, am I seriously going to run down and chase this guy down the street, and? take the beer back off him just to, you know, spare the supermarket the loss of, you know, a hundred kroner or something like that. Like, well, like, fuck no, you know, good luck to him. Skull. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I... How long did you work there for? Um, that was the best part of about six months. Uh, it was okay. actually in, in Oslo. Um, Sounds like the steadiest job you ever had, six well, months. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you a few things about it because it was fascinating. Mm. First of all, they had a they had a policy. The supermarket, I, I won't say <laughs> I probably better not say the name now because of what I'm going to tell you, but they had this mm. policy, David. If you could find an item on the shelves, right, and it went out of date, mm-hmm. either either it if it went out of date on this day, right? Yeah. You could take it up to the counter and say, excuse me, this goes out of date today. Mm. And they say, okay, it's yours. Literally give it to you for free, right? Wow. They must have had people in there doing that. Yeah. If, <laughs> if you found an item that had already gone out of date, legally they couldn't let you have it because it was out of date. Yeah. They would, they would, give you the value in money so what i started to do it it became a hobby for anyone with that kind of Mm. i I don't know not scavenging mind but but you know people beach combing let's yeah yeah. beach combing that's a much better (coughs) expression so i started to finish my work in the suit and then i'd go around all the others and one time i looked in the in the freezer compartment there's there's six sides of salmon and they've all gone out of date. So wow. I'm just pick them up, take them to the check the checkout. And of course, a side of salmon over there, you, you're talking it's probably about 40 quid, maybe. I, I mean, uh, yeah, it's still not cheap. Yeah. You know I mean? It's yeah. not cheap here, but this is Norway of all places. So, mm. so they're giving me... What do they call it? Lax, uh, don't they? Mm. Yeah, lax, yaks, yeah. or gra- grave lax, which grave is when, lux, they, yeah. when they bury it. Um, yeah. which is an ancient uh, Scandinavian fish preserving technique for anyone who's wondering why you bury fish. Uh, you do it yeah, I think they do that. Yes. In Sweden, I've seen it. And it stinks to high heaven too. Uh, that's yeah. That's in Iceland. They call it harkol, which is a shark. that's that's got so much u- uric acid in it. You can't mm. eat it. You have to bury it for a year. Uh, then you come back. And this is all kind of, you know, Inuit sort of technique, mm, mm. but so that was that. That that that's what I would do. Um, but the other thing as well. I mean, was that enough to um, I don't know get a subsistence level living out of uh, scanning the shelves? Well, here's the thing, right? I was I worked there for six months, and on the first month, my pay came through, and I went to the boss, and he was a very nice guy. I mean, the, the, the they're Scandinavian, all nice. yeah. Scandinavians, generally speaking, are, they're, they're a bit conservative, but they're generally really nice. Mm. And I said, boss, look, you, you, I've got a student's pay. I'm, I'm, I'm an adult. They'd given yeah. me the, what you'd pay a student, you know, the minimal 
the mm, minimum yeah. min, below minimum wage even and it never got sorted out despite me continually asking so by the time six months come around i kind of got a bit cross about it david and so mm. what what happened was <laughs> get myself in trouble here but somebody would come in and you get a couple of things you get people that didn't want to uh q q q or, or people in a hurry no they'd come running in say chris 40 smokes whatever the, the mm. brand was there and you'd you'd give them 40 smokes and as you went to hit the till they just thrust the money at you and they'd run well mm, interesting at, at, which, <laughs> at which point i began turning to the till because there's a camera on me yeah, yeah, yeah. typing it in, but without actually hitting a key mm, mm. and then surreptitiously hitting the till open button and the right, till would yeah. go ching ching. And I put them, you know, put Some the money them. in, close it and ju just making out that he'd give me the exact money. And I'd put yeah, it in the, yeah, yeah. the other thing would happen is someone would come up, save a crate of beer. Mm. But that's a lot of money. You know, you're talking, it's very high tax on beer, isn't it? Oh, you're talking maybe it's fifty pounds or something. It's it's quite. I mean, one beer can be fifty crowns. Mm. So ten beer, five hundred crowns. So so that's about fifty. And fifty quid. quid. Yeah. If it's twenty beers in a pack, it's a hunt about a hundred pack. I mean, it's quite a lot. Yeah. So they come through, put the beer on the thing, on the conveyor belt. Mm. I would turn. I, I would scan it into the the till right and then i turn and, and rather than um and right and no that's what i do i'd scan it into the till and then i'd hit check price okay. if, if someone had said chris can you check the price of that for me i'm yeah sure so i'd scan mm. it hit check price they'd look at the number that would come up you know um let's just call it 100 krona yeah 50 50 krones mm. and I'd, I'd look at them. They would then naturally hand me the money as you would still not realizing I haven't put this in the till yet. I've just hit. No, I've no. just hit the check price. Mm. And then I'd hit the till open bunny button. You get mm. so good at calculating in your mind the price when you do a job like that. You can the yeah. mass just becomes instantaneous and instant in my mind. I know what change I've got to give them. Mm. I'd mm. hand them the change and then I would just hit the button on the till which said print last receipt okay. and, then, and then the machine would go brrr, brrr, and the paper would come out by and they'd never time, read it yeah. by which time they're halfway out the shop yeah yeah, yeah. and I, I didn't do it an awful lot david i have to say but in all the times i did it nobody ever turned around and said to me oh can i have the receipt had they yeah. done so i would have gone yeah sure oh sorry it's not gone through properly i would have just screwed it up thrown it in the bin and then just and rang it through properly. It, kind of can i have that back and then then done it sort of properly but mm -hmm. um, let's just say i made a, a couple of quid to go traveling travel oh, that, that, i mean look, that supplemented your wages commensurate which of the level of your value i, I like to think yes. that uh that was balancing the books after all they were paying you as a student and study you did studied the formation of the till very well yes <laughs> and one other thing i i did i'm sorry if i'm giving young people no up. no no uh. friends listening believe me believe it from someone who's been there i'll find being law abiding is just so much the best way <laughs> not having to look over your shoulder and and wonder when your your liberty is going to be taken away it's, it's tiring it, it, yeah. it's it's, yeah. it's please believe me this is my young misspent youth but yeah, right. having nothing. given all those disclaimers give us another juicy bit okay so <laughs> i get a bin bag you know big industrial mm. kind of bin bag and when it was just me in the shop i i i knew where all the cameras looked so i knew how to tip it's a bit like a a, a tom cruise movie i knew how oh, to right. move the around the shop and all of that yeah. and i'd go around the shop and i'd just pick all my favorite food <laughs> So yeah. tins of this, mm. joint joints of this, a big pack of beer, and I'd fill this bin bag and then I'd go and throw it in the skip. And of oh, course, right. of course, after locking up that evening, 
if either I locked up or someone mm. else locked up, I'd just leave it. And then I'd cycle back after mm. hours at, in, in the dark, again, avoiding any uh, the camera, which is pointing sort of at the yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And I'd go open the skip, pull out this huge bag of food and... Uh, Oh, that sounds like a perfectly sensible way of uh, getting through. And wisely didn't um, knock off for the day and immediately run round to the skip. That that would have. Uh, that would, well, I mean, it would have worked once, but if somebody saw you regularly going round to the skip, you know, that might have been. It's that funny thing where I I don't I I think karma is definitely a thing. I think I've paid for, for, for my behaviours in life. I, I think I've, <laughs> I've paid. You've the balanced pipe. the books, have I've paid the pipe a big time, and I and, and I'm 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 glad to learn from these lessons because it's meant my life's mm. pretty, pretty balanced now. But you've got mm. to remember, Norway have been blessed with actually living next to the, one of the biggest oil fields in the world. <laughs> I know it's extraordinary, isn't it? They have a sovereign wealth fund. It's uh, actually worth something whereas every other country i can think of in the west owes its uh, gross uh, net um income several times over um in in debts that they just rack up especially these days. yet their their citizens are taken care of from cradle to grave for the next several generations due to that uh, it's uh, if you go sick in Scandinavia, yeah. Sweden or Norway, you don't just get some like dole payout for 50 quid a week or whatever it is we get here. Right. You get your full salary. Really? Mm. I had a friend, Steiner, yeah. which funny enough translated means stoner, stone. Uh, <laughs> and he was yeah. a big, big stoner. But he, right. went, he went away on one of these factory fishing ships where they scoop up all the fish and they've got the crew mm. on board to fillet them as they go. So they make double the money and get it to market yeah. really quick. And it gets frozen on board, doesn't it? It's it frozen yeah. on board. It's, mm. oh, it's a refri you know, big refrigeration ship as well. And it's very boring, hard work. I did it at shore based in a factory for, I managed nine months of it. Mm. And... He hated the job so much he took the filleting knife and they're razor sharp and he just went wow pulled it across his palm put a, a gash so deep it you mm. can see the sinews of his oh what well, all the cables were revealed uh, and all uh, that. but he did it and then of course he got uh seven months off work full mm. pay full pay and that's full pay even back then was probably two to three thousand pounds a month and we're talking again uh, 20, yeah. 20 20 years ago so mm. probably about five five thousand pounds five or six thousand pounds now it was a, a a lot of pay that you get on those ships um, i suppose though when you uh, it sounds pretty gruesome but on the other hand um at least he didn't like stick a hand into a thrashing machine or or, or have his leg broken. Um, I've seen people with, I knew a guy once who wanted to get to an outside hospital from within a prison that um, went to the gym and, and put his leg between two benches and said to a colleague, uh, oh, listen, grab that uh, 50 kilo uh, uh, major weight there and drop it on my leg. And after three attempts, it shattered it into like a trillion little bits. And um, Lucky Bob, that was his name, he never walked properly again after that. And it didn't stop him trying to escape. But your friend didn't, you know, you know, maim himself for life. As bad as that cut was, you could see it's on a thing that will heal up. Uh, he might have gone a little deeper than perhaps he should have, but, you know. David, have you seen um, uh, Billy's film? Oh, Billy Moore's. Yeah. Uh, a Prayer Before Dying, is that one? Yeah. Well, I have, and um, I don't know what you thought about it, but I thought it looked very good. I've got a friend in uh, lives in Thailand who um, uh, is wealthy and throws money into things, and he um, um, put some into that. I don't know if it, it... It must have done at least well enough to 
you know, paid for itself. Um, but as I say, I thought it looked very good. Didn't have a great resemblance to uh, life in there. But it was, don't you think, after all, more of a sports film than anything else. You know, a young man overcomes adversity and uh, fights his way out of trouble. Um, and so it was, it was good from that point of view. As I say, I, not only a passing resemblance to the, the real way of living in there. Because, you know, you know yourself that in captivity, most of the time is intensely boring. Um, and sitting around listlessly, wondering whether you can improve the quality of your food or, or something like what's, that. What's it like then? Because Billy obviously had a big um, yabba problem there. So that's... Mess. Well, yabba, I've... Um, I, I kind of lost interest in the personal use of uh, speedy things at a relatively young age because the you know, hangover was so, mm. the fatigue afterwards so draining and the temptation to think, oh, look, I just can't get through today without a little snifter of that to keep going. And then, anyway, but the Yabba thing, friends tell me, lingers. I mean, it, it, it's very slow to metabolize. So it's kind of within your system for a long time. And its name became muddied in Thailand and didn't need much mudding anyway, due to truck drivers um, yeah. going constantly, banging at it, and then getting to the point where they're not exactly sleeping at the wheel, but they're no longer a conscious human being with the capacity to operate a truck, plowing into half a dozen people. Um, so um, it, it was considered you know, quite serious. But the life in the prison was um, mostly a lot of people confined in spaces. Uh, you can, when people first come in anywhere, um, they get the worst of it. And Thailand was no exception. Uh, the searches were ridiculously thorough going in. They'd, especially if you were Thai, they'd cut their soap bars in half, they'd squeeze the shampoo out onto a piece of newspaper, as with every other liquid. And um, and there was a, a behind a, what would it be, an old dirty beach towel from modesty was a couple of trustees with uh, wearing gloves with two brown fingers. And I think the fact that it was two fingers is insult to injury as they bent over. But the fact that the gloves were made of wool uh, was not helpful. <laughs> um, I dodged all of that by various uh, being a foreigner things and the chains. But they they go into, so the, the first night and the first few nights, you get the worst of it so that you'll be encouraged to make things better for yourself. We were lined up like sardines. It was so crowded in the first night cell, um, head to feet, head to feet, all down the line. And then the um, the cell boss, the trustee who runs the first night reception thing with his little square of lino over in the corner and his own two sub trustees, which were his servants. And he makes a long speech to the newcomers, which translates roughly as, well, I'm firm but fair. You know, he's sort of like the drill instructor for every asshole you've ever met since school onward. Uh, one thing I can't abide is people taking a shit in the place. Now, that's out of the question. At a pinch, you can go over and take a wee, but be quiet about it and nothing after midnight. Anyway, um, and then I think from there, another place which was pretty awful, packed in there, the fan didn't work, overcrowded, bed bugs, you're on the alert for all night, squashing them again, because you could see a line of squash bed bugs around the, the black and brown edges of the cell rim uh, where people had fought these off. So come morning, you're ready and willing to strike a deal. And the trustee, because prisoners run everything in the place, even opening the cell doors in the, in the, for the morning let out and locking them up, the guards just stroll around with their own gang of uh, odious trustees fawning and laughing at their cr crappy jokes and uh, giving them leg massages. But as, as you know from Asia yourself, 
uh, there's nothing like a whole bunch of people in a small space to um, bring out the organizational abilities of everyone. Mm. And the Thai Chinese, who really, uh, Chinese Thais run everything in Thailand. If, and, so you remember some years ago, the government even, they got sick of seeing Chinese names at the helm of every company, at the management levels, at the, the graduations, at the technical schools, at the engineers running the power station. So they made the um, Chinese ties of the second generation get Thai names, of which they chose from a handful that had a phonemic sound that mirrored something lucky in, in Mandarin. But nonetheless, it was still the Chinese running it. And no exception with prison. The Chinese ran the general store called the coffee shop for some reason. And it kind of sold everything from rice to, oh, it had a little barber shop next door. That was a sub concession. You could go in there with two rickety ancient 1920s barber shop chairs in there. Um, and you got, uh, there was some rude Frankie Valley pictures around an, an early Presley um, fading color photographs of the available hairstyles. A little lending library, a complete with, um, so you paid a fee for a, a, a novel or something like that, but most of its business was in um, low-level uh, pornography, which had been put, every page of the porno magazine for rent had been laminated, punch-holed, and put in a folder uh, and numbered. So it had to be returned with all the numbers sequential, so it hadn't been uh, torn out and thoughtfully laminated with something that could be sponged off. And it was good form to sponge off your return porno book in the morning. At the corner of the general store was a bank. Yeah, it had a little teller's window. Cash was outlawed, but the guard sitting there got his 10%. And he took that from the 25% that the Chinese bankers in there had managed to do something how they got to your official prison account to get it. What they did was, and you saw none of the machinery of how they worked this out, was um, they allowed prisoners who were well behaved to spend a small amount of their private money uh, to buy, I don't know, a jar of coffee or something. That was the wedge in the door. And the foreigners a bit more uh, of their money because they ate foreign things, you know. Uh, I don't know what it was that we ate, but caviar and champagne, but it certainly seemed that way with what we were paid. And so for every um, uh, every thousand baht that you take out in cash, you had to um, pay 1250 or something like that. Uh, so that was a good little business for them. And not only that, the cash that you got, you walk around the corner and you're paying it back to the same general store. That store, mind, you had to bung the building chief, uh, and there were 10 major buildings each with you know, 1,500 people, prisoners in there. Um, that building chief wanted a big chunk of the profits from the uh, coffee shop general store. Um, even they had a kind of a very secretive phone booth in a little storeroom within the coffee shop with a, one of the earliest, um, because when I was there was 90, three to 96, so um, mobile cell phones were um, in existence, but the network was poor. But nonetheless, they had one, so I, I could uh, could make a call. Um, and managed after um, various bits of hell to overcome to get through a call to my friend Michael uh, that I'd been business partners with, but also a good friend, and he hadn't heard from me for over a year, and had heard some rumor that I'd been grabbed in uh, Asia and was facing the death penalty. And by the time I got to use that phone, it must have been three o'clock in the morning when I connected through to his. And, um, you know, I'm pouring out or beginning to pour out a long explanation of what happened and why and everything. Michael said, look, they would don't explain anything. We might be cut off on this line. Just tell me where I've got to be and what I've got to bring. <laughs> and that's what you want from a friend, isn't it, Chris? 
I yeah. mean, <laughs> oh, sweet. Uh, and can and I, can I just I, yeah, go ahead. I just want to tell you my this wonderful story. When, mm. when Tor Heyerdahl built the Contiki raft, so the balsa wood raft to sail across the South Pacific, um, it, it, it's a treacherous journey. There's no like they haven't got a backup ship or anything like this. No, a, it's, a, it's a raft with a sail. And all they've got is a World War II radio that they can get the odd kind of, you know, radio ham on. If, if, if they're lucky, they'll get someone in bloody... Vlad of us talkers. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly, exactly, right? So, and, and when, if they make it to the islands that they were trying to prove that ancient indigenous populations did, even then they've got these treacherous reefs that they, they'll land on with, with these thunderous rollers coming in that will just, that can just wipe them out and kill, kill, drown them all, right? So, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a, it, it's what we would call <clears throat> a suicide mission. One of those ones where you put the ad in the paper, mm. volunteers required, uh, mustn't mind dying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, just have a very feeble grip on reality and uh, love of life. Yeah, so, so he, let, let mm. me just finish this yeah. one. He, he, he put the shout out to a guy called Torstein Rabbi, who was, a, a, I think he was the only Swede on, uh, on, the, on the raft. And, and he's this guy, um, they've all been, uh, they've all been resistance up in Norway during the war. So they're all hard as nails. They've been living in the snow, eating moss and all this and spying on the, the German shipping and stuff. So they're not, they're not opposed mm. to, a, a, you know, harsh conditions. So Tor Heidel, sent a telegram to Torsten Rabbi and said, I'm sailing a balsa wood raft across the Pacific to prove that indigenous communities traveled this way. Mm. Um, I need volunteers. And, and the reply Torsten Rabbi sent back was, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> so sure, every sweet. time, every time I'm asked now to do a challenge with, um, I'll say, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> now that's the, uh, yeah, it's the answer that you want uh, and tells everything. I, I was just picturing that um, the Con Contiki, was it? Contiki, yeah. Mm. That was his first, um, first expedition. And as you say, it was um, a demonstration that was feasible to uh, cross the Atlantic, um, <clears throat> which I think everybody accepts that certainly uh, Scandinavian fishing extended that far to um, well, New Newfoundland anyway. Yeah, it's funny that they actually modern DNA science has shown that the, the Polynesian Islanders, you know, Easter Island, this kind of that they actually are not related to South Americans. I think they're more related to New, New Zealand. So they'd come. Possibly. That's right. I mean, that, that is as far, uh, which way I'm going here, east, as you can imagine, isn't it, Easter Island? And um, the, thing, the thing they didn't realize is they didn't understand how steerable a raft is if you understand the technology. Right. You have these things called centerboards that you shove down it through the raft into the water. Mm -hmm. you, you can have any number of them configured in various configurations. Right. And it means when the wind hits that sail, you can actually steer against the wind and have mm. complete control over your boat as opposed to the theory that you're just at the in the mercy of the wind yeah yeah so uh that that isn't explains... there a, a kind of sail arrangement too that does a similar i forget the the nautical term for it but it, it's effectively when you look at the wind pattern and where it's going it's as though um you're sailing into a wind that should be pushing you back yeah where it but it's really a, a very close sideways angle where the wind is crossing that sail if you've done it right and instead of pushing against it is sucking it out so um the relative air pressures propel you well not absolutely forward but um on an angle so you can zigzag your way across the world um against what would be um a fairly standard trade wind the, Ta the tacking in essence isn't it tacking. yes yes that's, that's right. right um what happened to him at i know that was 
um, there was Contiki 2, which was a slightly different design, but there were also people who built um, uh, Viking uh, era replica boats that um, uh, pretty easily enough seemed to go over there. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at them, you, don't you get the feeling these people must have been pretty hardy uh, to to go out there with, um, okay, they'll have a barrel, no doubt, with fresh water and a couple of backup ones sealed so they don't get wrecked. And um, I don't know how much fishing they do, but um, they'd have um, everything that could be preserved by salting or, or, or whatever. And it's just been... incredible, isn't it? They just mm. lie down by their oar when they need to sleep. If mm. they get wet, sodden through, that's it. They're wet for the trip then. Um, they've got a small chest of their possessions and they just go out raiding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, th I remember uh, reading details of the um, Viking raid down the Seine uh, and an attack on Paris. Um, so... I guess the real art to it would be figuring how you can get your loot back, if that's what you're planning. <clears throat> there was a, it's been a quite a good um, set of studies in the last couple of years on using, you mentioned um, genetics and D DNA tracing with the Easter Islanders, but also with um, the, the accepted view of um, how Britain moved from the kind of people of the last of the Romans in when it was a 410 AD or something that they uh, officially left. But of course, they would have people who lived here at the time would have been well Romanized for you know a couple of generations after that until they couldn't get the the tiles repaired or the hyper cost fueled up underneath their their, their villas. Um, but I think the real I can imagine just the economics of it would have been the big difference. If you haven't got a paid for army uh, occupying places and spending money, it'd be like Bangkok uh, went into a bit of a decline after the Americans left Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the clubs closed. So you haven't got uh, post Romans the. Um... It's curious too that it never shows you how stubborn in a way in the, in the their views the people were that they never other countries became very romanized in the sense if we look at um uh, beyond italy to um to france and especially spain um what was called dacia and it was uh, bulgaria today so much of their structures um remained <clears throat> administratively uh, on, on the Roman model um, and when it was Christianized after uh, Constantine um, that kind of structure held but it didn't really hear but the the new studies of the DNA seem to suggest that rather than a whole bunch of um, Scandinavians coming over here and um, uh, making the uh, a dominantly Anglo-Saxon one from, from the Celtic, there is um, a mix which is relatively peaceful. Your, your Viking was more of a settler here uh, than a, a looter, because I, I'm guessing, because there wasn't much to loot, and it's expensive taking your loot back, uh, whereas um, I'm sure a lot of property changed hands post-Romans, and it, there might have been, uh, because it's never been documented, it might have been a bit of a um, a westward uh, land rush. You know, after all, Scandinavia's got limited um, um, agricultural possibilities because uh, it's much more seasonally strict, whereas yeah. I think the land... I, I can imagine a lot of more peaceful takeovers. Okay, they came here and... They might have had a little squabble, but there's no, there was no great finds of big battles or, or death or carnage. Um, and it, 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 I suppose we have that to look back on, that 
um, in the, the lands in which we are speaking now, have had relative peace for a couple of thousand years, apart from what a Cromwellian civil war and a couple of Catholic purges here and there, a few, a few crazy kings, um, but without any real effect. And, and yet um, other countries have had disastrous things great sweeps of uh, carnage and Mongol invasions and, uh, and changes. Um, <clears throat> where, uh, and yet, um, it was only, I guess, in the Industrial Revolution that, um, you know, powered up Britain to spread its wings a bit and go around and uh, cause trouble in other parts of the world. But at the same time, you know, ex export some, uh, well, a lot of railways anyway. Uh, that's a good mm -hmm. thing. The Jaipur Express probably wouldn't exist. Did you ever take uh, rail journeys for pleasure? Oh, gosh, yes. You haven't lived, have you? If you haven't, I mean, some memorable ones. Bangkok to, um, uh, it's not. It doesn't go down as far as Phuket, does it? Phuket's an island, but wh wh where? Are we? Um, you can take the train uh, from, I think, Chiang Mai. I mean, not one train, but you change a few, all the way down past through Bangkok to Is the south to Suratani, the Malaysian border. Sur Suratani, Surinat, Sur. Uh, yeah, um, there's a crossing, and I, I had some reason to check it out. Uh, um, I think it stops about, um, it used to stop about 50 miles shy of the border on the main line, and there were buses crossing into Malaysia. But I'm guessing now there might even be a proper rail link all the way down to the tip of Penang or something for all that we know. Um, yeah, I've, I've, um, I mean, do, did you get sleepers or, or just a yeah, good sleep on the, your seat or, I got, or what? I got the sleeper from, Bangkok down basically a state of state state and was staying at Koh Samui. So whichever way you get oh, ferry, right. yeah. whichever, wherever the ferry goes from, I think it's Suratani or apologies if I've got that wrong. I've done that trip, which is just wonderful. Back in my drinking days, you could buy a beer for 50 P and just sit, <laughs> back, sit back in your chair, yeah. come five o'clock or six in the evening. They all come around and say, excuse me a minute, sir. And they miraculously, yeah morph this chair into a bed comfortable okay. bed yeah. me and my brother were um smoking joints out the window mm. <laughs> i've just dropped my brother in the shit there um no oh, it was years ago yes it was a long long time ago but uh that was memorable i went from moscow to st petersburg on one of the old just just a real old sleep sleeper train i got in the carriage mm -hmm. there was a gentleman in there and i said hello and he said hello and uh that was the extent of his english i, think. I said in english he said um ruski and i said yeah, 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 yeah. no he went portuguese sing <laughs> we both spoke portuguese so really yeah. he, he'd been um he'd been part of the rebel one of the rebel supporting the rebels for lima or was it renam renam uh, yeah um yeah something like that Dur yeah. during the during, uh, during the civil war in mozambique and i'd worked in mozambique as a as a um volunteer worker so so what were we, you doing uh, what, in a peaceful capacity volunteer worker, was it? Yeah, I taught in a street children's school for six months okay. in a place called Nicala Porto. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so lucky in my life, David. I can't believe I've had such incredible experiences like that mm. on, the, on the edge of the Indian Ocean or the Mozambique Channel. Um well, you know, that's what we, as, as um, English speakers, at, at worst, that's, that's what we can do. We're, how many friends have you come across? Say, well, I, you know, I was at a, kind of at the end of things then, and so I taught English at uh, something or other, a local uh, 
private school or a volunteer school. My old friend, uh, John uh, uh, Russell, who uh, was in, in Thailand uh, with me for a while, um, after 20 years there, finally let him go. But he retired to um, uh, Cambodia uh, and lives there. And that's one of his things that he does. He, he teaches um, uh, English and science at a, um, a local kind of free school. And it, it's, it's very, very common. I mean, you don't get paid anything, really. If you're lucky, you get a meal out of it or something like that. But you do get... Um, you make friends, uh, you get to meet the, the regular teachers and um, they'll help you out. Uh, one way or another, you'll find accommodation. So, you know, it is that uh, um, uh, we English have an ability to survive uh, on, and, and not a great objection to, you know, taking that transition to, to well, you shouldn't, uh, none of us should, be too upset by having to live uh, modestly. Those, those who can't adapt to that really uh, are too tightly wound up in um, the, the things they expect of life, of the, not just the material things, but their social position and all of that nonsense, which counts for nothing, as mm. you know. Um, <clears throat> and it can be very relaxing, can't it, if this got, you, you, you've lost the pressure to, to meet. I mean, I'm, you know, looking at your life, I am half surprised uh, that you haven't um, set up uh, living in Asia somewhere. And um, I don't know what doing. Believe but, me, it's, it's a conversation we have a lot in this house. Mm, I, no, man. I will say paradise number one starts in our heads, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. But secondly, to have somewhere you can go out for a dip in the ocean every morning. I mean, that, that, that. Oh, that'd be a dream, wouldn't it? That's like yeah. a double. I mean, I, I live by the ocean here in the UK, so I, I, I'm not that far away, but it's a big difference plunging into a beautiful, pristine mm. blue sea in Thailand than it is into the freezing cold. Uh, you know. Where do you think would be, uh, where do you think it'd be good? I always thought that the um, the potential. I mean, there's only so much coastland in the world, isn't there? You know, it's not going to get any more of it. It'll actually, get less of it as the seas rise. Um, what happened to Doggerland? It's gone. If we, you think southern um, Cambodia, um, Myanmar, some of the uh, lower islands down there that have uh, serviceable links with Thailand across the way. Well, where do you think it'd be good to set up a ne'er do wells last retreat hotel? Well, I'm always going to say, and I don't know how realistic that this is now, but mm. off Belize. Oh, a, right. Yeah. There's a series of keys. Uh, one of them's called Kai Korka. Right, and it's actually been split in half by a hurricane. Mm -hmm. So it's probably not the best place to to set up camp. But I went there, David, and I've scuba dived. I've been lucky to scuba dive in lots of locations around the world. From from the Arctic, I've scuba dived in the Antarctic. I've scuba dived in. God, oh, I think I've scuba dived in Argentina. Central America, Asia, um, uh, Egypt, all these kind of places, or, or Red Sea. Here's the thing. Most of the stuff you see on the dive sites in these places is all dead. The tourism has just killed every, all the corals de dead. The, really? Yeah. You, you go out in a group of maybe just 10 people in your dive expedition Mm. And you've got a guide that's showing you the local thing. And they'll be like, look, look. And mm. Everyone crowds around with their underwater cameras. And it's a little fish about that big. And <laughs> it's sad. Apparently it's like really <laughs> rare, but you don't really care about that. No. You, uh, they, 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 then you go to Belize. Right? Yeah. You're there in the blue hole, for example. Mm -hmm. The big blue hole is an underground cavern that's... I've seen down. pictures of them, yeah. yeah. Very... Mm -hmm. pr Aren't they dark? 
Uh, yeah, it's black. When you look down, it's black. It's black, right? Yeah, but you, you go down the wall of this crater. Yeah. Um, as an advanced diver, you can go down 40 meters, although you don't want to spend too long at that depth. And you have to, the, the deeper and longer you go, you have to stage your way coming back up. Don't yeah. You? And also, because air compresses at depth, mm. you breathe more of it a lot quicker and you can really get into trouble if you're not... Calculated you know, your tanks properly. Yeah. It's different now. You have a dive computer on your wrist and it kind of tells you what to do. But mm. So I'm there. I'm at the back of a group of fellow divers and the dive guides at the front. And mm. I'm, we're fin finning along and it's just, it's wonderful. It's, it's just wetsuit, no dry suit or anything. And then the dive guy just, just turns to me and, go, <laughs> and says, shark. <laughs> yeah. so I, I turn around and out, out of the deep blue come 12 sharks just swam right up to me, literally just swam past my shoulder as if I wasn't even, even there. I reached for my dive knife just, just as a precaution. And the last shark was a bull shark. So uh, the, the, the other ones were, were fairly benign, but the, the, mm. the, there was a bull shark tagged on at the back of them. Uh, bull sharks are, are known for the most attacks on, on man. Um, not that I was in any way thinking that was going to happen. It was a beautiful experience. But, mm. but, but if you go in the national parks there that they've carefully preserved... It's like hopping into a fish tank in your local pet shop. It is just really? vibrant, tropical fish mm. everywhere. Huge lobsters. So the, yeah. you know, the locals, they sneakily will put their mask and snorkel on, go into the, yeah, um, yeah. Go into the um, nature reserve, when, and they'll stay down for 40 minutes with, diving mm. and they've got a metal gaff and they're basically going after the lobsters and they'll yeah, yeah, fill a yeah. huge bag um and it was just unbelievable to every dive mm. you do you see a big shark loads of other fish. now this was um this was in belize but it was on the keys you're saying off the yeah. coast yes off the coast and how is it set up is there a of course there's a dive center i guess but is there accommodation there yeah, you just find um, back then, it, obviously it will all have changed now because this was a while ago, but back then we had a guidebook. It wasn't Lonely Planet because that was a bit cheesy. That was kind of the yeah, main, yeah. mainstream tourist. The other one that was a, um, a kind of somewhat grungier alternative to Lonely Planet. It'll come to me, but there, were, there, yeah, there, there wasn't was, another one. Yeah. yeah, there was Lonely Planet and then there was... Mm. Was it so, a sh shoestring traveler? Something on a shoestring, yeah. Like they'd name, name a country, um, Central America on a, a shoestring, and they'd include places like But for the Americas, there was actually mm. a deluxe book, completely, okay. uh, you know. Well, very thorough, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, like, like uh, say, crap analogy, but port to wine, you know, okay. or. or, or Port to port to cider. It was it was oh, a real nice. really refined book. They put put a lot of effort into, mm. and it told you immediately. You got to a place, you went to the accommodation section, right, and you could go for the two star, the three, or the four. So the four was like your, you know, mm. the Ritz would be listed there. The two, or or the maybe it was five star. I don't know. Maybe, but but the what? But I just always go for the one star. I'd get the cheapest dive I could find. Mm. Mm. Cockroach. I'd hang up my mosquito net, and and so in Belize, that's what I would have done. And you know, in Belize, uh, um, John McAfee, the um, what was he? The security pr programs for uh, computers. He was oh, the founder just, of that um, company. He went to, um, uh, to kind of, as a sanctuary, ended up in uh, Belize. Got tangled up in a, um, a shooting there of a neighbor or something. Uh, they're not saying he didn't, but they're not saying he didn't. Uh, and he kind of took off from there and got bailed in Costa Rica or something like that. 
I don't know where he is now. I mean, it's always a bit of a... He's dead now, David. Oh, that's right, he died, yeah. He got suicided, didn't he, from what... Yeah, yeah, you're right. I knew the reason there was a... <laughs> the story was in my head for something. And uh, what do you think that's... Uh, uh, it was a bit suspicious. He's... If, mm. There's a, quite a few videos buzzing around of him on YouTube where, where, in his, where when he was on the, on the hoof, mm. he did a lot of podcasts with people and he's... A very, unusual sort of person, wasn't he? Yeah, quite an intense sort of guy, but yeah, yeah. but you can tell what comes out of his mouth. He's lived a bit, mm. and he and he knows who's can pull in all the strings. Well, yeah, and he was um, a good mathematician. He uh, um, uh, okay, he sold uh, the, the company early on and, and took the money and ended up living with some young kind of like half street girl. Uh, but she was very attached to him and was always loyal to him. Uh, but, um, it, it, okay, uh, what he says about Belize, I'll take with a pinch of salt, because I used to have connections there when it had some very interesting banking for the independent-minded person. Um, you could set up a company there and issue um, your banking cards to whoever you wanted. It's just that when we were traveling and you'd have a, say, you went off with a new passport, you'd want some uh, credit cards to go with that. Uh, especially so as the world changed and you couldn't do anything without using a card for it. But rather than having a, a spin-off card, an extra card from an account that was linked to something, uh, the Belize uh, economy is a big banking sector, so you could set your company up there and run it. But uh, <clears throat> It, it's unusual, isn't it? It was British Honduras for a long time, then uh, had independence. McAfee said it was uh, notoriously corrupt and this and that and the other, but yeah. So what? Um, you're going to expect that around that part of the world. But would, do you think, um, I mean, if we set up um, you know, kind of a hotel or, or something there, that would be stable enough environment for it um or pleasant enough to live in it is it is it, is it it's full-on tropical isn't it the weather yeah it's 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 lovely i mean what we think of as tropical beaches as, as westerners mm. very often you get to places and and it's not you're very surprised like for example vietnam i i thought vietnam i just think tropics it's tropical yeah, yeah beaches yeah. are going to be paradise and no, it's quite rugged there. The the, the very rocky wind, coastline wind, was it? Yeah, rugged, windswept coastline. I don't mean rugged as in like no, Port no, Cornwall. No. I mean it's the winds blowing. It's it's whereas as you know in Thailand, you go to a beach. Oh, um, some of them are great. They're sheltered God, and uh, stunning, mm. absolutely yeah, yeah. stunning. Um, Belize is that. It's that one. It's the. Sun. Oh, is it? Okay, um, yeah, because I. I looked at it geographically and it seemed to have a lot of um in the more north in belize you went in a lot of it was marked as kind of swampland um and i'm imagining all these uh, mosquitoes but mm -hmm. i think um so you would you'd be your inclination for your tropical haven would be more likely to be I, that way than I, say asia it's it's a difficult one because I was in Australia, for example, and you, you, all my life, I'm that age, and, and, and obviously you, you know this too, David, that, that mm. lots of poms emigrate to Australia because they think it's the land of milk and honey. It's going to be this big, big life. And, and I'm not saying it's not. Australia an incredible country, especially mm. when you get up into, into the tropics. But... What I found is, is I found the expats there were really bland. Almost. Mm, bland. I know. Yeah, that, that can be the case. I you mean, know, they were just bland. They were like a football shirt and mm. not, not not much up top. And I'd, look, look at when you go to Portugal and you, you look at the expat uh, com, uh, British community yeah. there. They they are pretty dull. Yeah, yeah, dull. Just not the yeah. sort of people you think. Not party animals, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or not even interesting people early but i can tell you what though 
if, if you were on the run or something, that would be the place to mingle into like a, a not a particularly high, low level Spanish away from the coast, you know, British expats. You'd, nobody, you could be splattered all over the TV news and your neighbor would say, I don't think I've seen that guy around. No, no, yeah. And he's talking to him. <laughs> um, well, you've got quite a strong connection with Australia, David, haven't you? I, I never really, uh, yes, of course. And I, and I spent uh, many early years there. Yeah. And uh, a little, when I was 12, I was in the, one of the net, Channel 9 networks. Um, they had a junior news for kids. Uh, and I read that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> fell in love with my co-presenter. I was 12, she was 17. It wasn't Oh, I've done out, that. You know? I've done that. And that hurts. Oh, it was tragic. I was uh, very deeply moved. And um, she became a ballerina, of all things. I often wonder what happened to her. But it's the only ones that last, isn't it? And I, and I'll tell you a, what. I wish you could bottle that. Uh, the intense the feeling, feeling that you have. Of young love when you've got a crush on someone and they're older. Oh, mm. oh, gosh, you're besotted. We went to mm. Fran France on a school trip. Right. And we were like 10 years old. And they'd got one of the former pupils to come as a sort of chaperone for the kids. And, and she was uh, the grand old age of 14 or something, right? Yeah. yeah. And Over she the had, hill. Hmm. She had boobs and everything and 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 i i just developed this massive crush on her what so you were mooning about her uh well all the time. when we got back i had the most horrible holiday crash mm. i just crawled into bed under the duvet apparently i had all my clothes on and my backpack still and i just crawled into <laughs> bed. and then when we went yeah. back to school one of the teachers had had kindly um taken all these wonderful photos with it with his decent camera and we had all okay. the we had all the tanks on the beach at Aramanch and all this sort of stuff and mm. every photo I bought had this picture, girl of, picture of Lorna Lorna in it and there she is on sitting on a tank and there she is outside the Eiffel Tower and there, I there bet she... I bet you treasured those photographs for years oh I don't know I have no idea where they are now. I think they've long gone by the by, but mm. I met I met her in a pub about six or seven years ago. And oh, I, did you? Yeah. Uh, but I, and I bet you then there was no, this was like meeting a totally different person, uh, I'm sure. The, yeah, the thing is though, and this is the thing about, uh, I talk about enlightenment a lot, being an enlightened person and, and, mm. and not, is. If someone came up to me in a pub and said, do, do you know what, I've got to say, I had a massive crush on you. Mm. I, I'd really understand how important that was in that person's life. I would I would now. Mm. I would, probably wouldn't have done in years gone by. In fact, I can tell you, I, I it, the same thing happened to me. No. Um, I won't... I won't go, go into that. It sounds like there's a story there, Chris. Well, it... Yeah, let's just say that that was quite a. And uh, uh, did uh, did this person uh, who had the crush on you ever express the depth of the love that was felt to you? Wow, well, I, 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 I've I've got to be careful what I say. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I know where you're heading with this. I've got to be careful what still, I say, but uh, my God, she come up to me and said, "This girl come up to me on a random night out. I was in 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 in, in the city, and and she went, you 'You're Chris.'" Do you remember me? And I was like, no, should I? She went, and then she hit me with all this kind of undying love. Thing. Yeah. 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 But, remember, uh, Buxton's holiday camp in 1968. Yeah, it was that kind, that kind of, <laughs> that kind of like what, where it's actually a one night, one night romance. But, mm -hmm. but the thing with this, uh, this Lorna was, I think she was a bit kind of maybe a not embarrassed, but she was like, oh, right, okay. And then I felt I felt the big idiot, David, but pouring yeah. my heart out. Well, to, that's know. the thing is, I mean, ideally you want, uh, you know, oh, she you want to her say, to say, is, oh, yeah, I remember you. Yeah, yeah you oh, were a cute could, little thing or something. You could have just said, oh, that is so sweet. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. thank you. You know, it, it, 
but she was like, oh, Brit. <laughs> what does that mean? You're my stalker now. Are you the guy that's been <laughs> shitting in my letterbox? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. well, I wonder where, who's been nicking my underwear off the line. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it is. Um, um, I, I, I think adults are very quick to um, dismiss and belittle what um, preteens and, and adolescents think about um, you know, the, their attachments to things. But um, we do so at the loss of uh, uh, some of the things that uh, remain only in our deepest nighttime dreams when you, know, you, you wake up and think, wow, yeah, I remember. Um, because in a dream, of course, people embody different shapes and forms and personalities from the past. But, and you say to yourself, well, I really haven't felt that level of intensity about anything for, uh, uh, I wonder whether heaven's like that, that you, you, know, you get back that sharp edge of uh, sensation with, with things. But mm. I don't know, and perhaps uh, the future of humanity lies in, um, I always suspected it might lie in simulated worlds where the intensity of our feelings is you know, cranked up a bit to 11 on the old dial. Um, what about the feeling, and here's another one for you, mm. when you've just cleared customs and, and it's all good and, and you're away to your hotel and you're <laughs> not, I, I, I'm not trying to discharge mm. myself of any wrongdoings in this, but I never actually, I only ever took stuff for personal use. Uh, no, so you wouldn't want to be nicked with it. So no, you know, no. Uh, when you clear the, the zone of death. When I when uh, I went through know. the airport in India, I was on my way to Thailand, mm. and I had a blim of hash. I had one of those animal watch straps, the vel the vel ah, yes, yes, once, yes, yes, yes. and I, I'd always, I either would place my my blim there and just put the watch strap over it, mm. or I do, or I had Tiva sandals with the Velcro, and I'd pop it in the middle of there. And, by the time you put the Velcro over and sort of crush it down a bit, it's pretty inno innocuous. But but then, mm. of course, what did they start doing? They started scanning the shoes, didn't they? Oh, look, there are lots of nuisance things. Um, I, uh, yeah, I had a, um, I did a bit of banking once uh, at the age of 16 and I had to wear a blonde wig. Uh, and after that, I realized that when you're wearing a, a full wig, you have a little gap at the back of it that can hold a couple of ounces. Um, and, and generally speaking, nobody asks you to take your hair off. Um, but with the advent of uh, terrorism, a lot of things, um, you know, you're right, you didn't expect to get your shoes uh, taken off. Uh, even by not long before I retired, I had to kind of rewrite the manual for uh, people traveling around, you know, as guidelines as to what to do with specific airports and they do this here and there, like there was one out of, uh, uh, where is it, Aruba, north of um, uh, Colombia. If, if you set off anything on the walkthrough on that um, airport machine, then they make you take shoes off. For So for all the people doing footwear runs, had to supply them with plastic belts and make sure the zips of their pants were also um, non-ferrous. Um, it made everything you know, quite a lot more more difficult like that. I was going to ask you what's uh, what's on your plate uh, these days. Have you got? Uh, um, have you done um, any audio recordings of your your books? No, I wanted to talk about writing with you. Mm. Probably one of my favourite subjects. Um, well, yeah, I've just released uh, the audio uh, version of Unforgiving Destiny and. Um, Having recorded it, I was going to say this to you, you'll find if you do that, it's a quite a bit of a different experience um, listening to uh, the audio version. It's not just like, because it happened to you and you're the one saying it, it's not like um, just an actor's narration of the thing. It, it becomes its kind of unique form. It's something um, perhaps you... And a, and a lot of people... Um, that's certainly the, the kind of um, viewers I get. There might be 7,000 subscribers, but I think uh, all but uh, only, you know, 
I don't know, 500 of them are particularly avid book readers, but um, a, a lot of them like to listen. And um, you probably find <clears throat> the people who watch your videos flick from time to time at the screen, but mostly they're listening. Yeah. And what we're saying now will be listened to a lot more than so let's run, Let me run some practicalities by you. So mm. first off, obviously, you've got the perfect voice to narrate any book, let alone your own book. I well, yeah, I didn't have to hire somebody and I thought yeah. it was better coming from you. Yeah, yeah, you're very, very measured when you speak, David, which is what you need, isn't it? You need to be uh, consistent. Um, look, that was the great hurdle. Um the technical one in the beginning, I had to understand what, it's run by Real Mafia, the Amazon Audible thing, they're the only game in town, and even the big publishers have to kowtow to them. Now their recording standards are quite narrow, must be between minus 18 and minus 24 I, I trust, I can all trust all that on, even on this, this isn't my, I've got sure microphones, so basically the best ones. Yeah, sure's get. are good. Yeah, or but also AKGs. just this is cheap Yeti Blue. I can hit all the levels for for Audible. Once you understand how to use Audacity. Yeah, yeah, no, it works fine. You, yeah. you need a um, probably you could use the Yeti. Maybe add a pop filter on it because that um, does does have an effect. Anyway, mm. the. Um, the timings for it, you need uh, a half to one second uh, before each chapter. The chapters can't go longer than 120 minutes. You leave three seconds at the end of it. Um, there's some other minor formatting issues, like it has to be in a certain kind of mono, but all that's, you could deal with all of that. So uh, you could produce your audio book instead of going to an outside company, yeah. providing you pad the room up with enough blankets, you can knock it out yourself rather than paying what would be about the equivalent of 11 or 12 grand uh, to get involved with the studio. How long did it take? It took me a long time because when I listened to it back and I listened to a lot of other recordings on the edit for it, I decided to take out most of the breaths between speak uh, and uh, between sentences and even in parts of sentences except where they were part of a bit of dialogue or it was necessary for the effect where I, I was surprised or I needed a, a, the intake of breath was important and something's, you know, action and you know, gasping for breath. But most of the routine ones uh, I took out, which, which took a lot of time. You don't have to, but, um, and I've also found that listeners to them often listen to them at multiplied speed at one and a half times, sometimes more. Um, and if the breaths are in there, then they can stand out. There is a, you can use a very, you have to do this very carefully. Um, in Audacity, you can import um, from, I think they're called Neukist uh, filters. They're around about on the web. It's a noise gate. What it is, as it's, it's Audacity is listening, as the level drops off, say when you've stopped speaking, and you take in a breath, that breath on the recording levels is only at about, uh, well, it's like minus 35 dB or something. So you can adjust the noise gate to cut out anything mm. that's there. But I also wanted to cut it out in terms of time, not just the sound of the breath. So that was a bit of fiddling, but I don't think, I, I'd recommend probably against it, don't worry about the breaths, but especially with your story, which has got action in it, it's got despair, it's got highs, it's got lows. I think more personality comes through when it sounds like a, a living person. I, I was too affected by the kind of robotic examples that uh, Amazon were giving me. Um, and the turnaround time's a lot quicker too. It used to be months before you'd hear back from them because a human being had to listen in. Mm. Scammers, of course. <laughs> uh, they were um, getting um, robots to uh, read out text, calling it a book, banging it up, getting uh, oh, yeah. a nightmare. So they, they had to get a human involved at least to scan through the chapters. Did you, you get the audible plug-in, the checker. You can, you can... Yeah, yeah, I got that. And um, 
it will sometimes tell you something that you can't credit. I mean, you've made your little studio as quiet as possible. You put up a bit of foam and so on. But um, you, you, if the chapter's too long, you, you can't try and check the whole thing. It'll be too slow and it won't give you much information. But you say you take a, a two, three minute section of it and run it through the checker, ACX checker. And it says your noise floor is, is too noisy. You know, it's above the minus 60, which is their cutoff point. But it might not necessarily be the case. And um, so you don't, you can hear it if it's too noisy. But here's the thing, they don't want absolute silence between the parts you're speaking and not speaking or the beginning and the end because the machine's got to pick up that yes, a new chapter has started or yes, a chapter is finished. So they want a little, what do they call it, room tone uh, yeah, in there. Can, there's a way you can copy and paste that, isn't there? You can... Well, I did that in the end because I was manipulating the um, taking out sections, which were pretty dead, like minus 120 dB, which is virtually no sound, uh, to make sure that at least the beginning and ending um, room tone was accurate. I made some room tone at minus 72 dB. Uh, and cut and paste those in there so that they were always consistent. But it, it's worth doing. There's some, um, if you go ahead with it, I'll tell you some other pitfalls about it um, in the way they do their accounting. They let them do returns, you see. Uh, and canny uh, subscribers don't will save their credits on Audible by returning a certain amount of books. They're like given seven days to return it. And you know what? Audible is a subscription thing. So they get their money regardless of what somebody listens to or doesn't listen to. They, when a book gets returned, they claw the money back from you, your, your slice of the royalties. When it doesn't cost them anything, when it doesn't affect their subscription, they still get their money. Why should you pay? Um, it's quite unjustified and some people, but. On the other hand, looking at my first couple of weeks' figures, it's I've had one return out of 400 sales. So, Whoa! Um, it's, as Sean Atwood said to me, don't worry about that. It's, it's nothing. Um, they're, uh, you know, you, you can rely on them to have worked out the uh, algorithm um, so they can, but they make sure that they don't lose their money, and it's only us. The suckers at the cold face of uh, the entertainment industry, you could say, it, and it's most general. Um, I think you should take all of your catalogue and, and read yeah, it through. I, I, I've been working towards doing it for so long now. I've, I've got um, my podcast manager, Luke. Hello, Luke. He's come on board and I'm gradually putting everything his way, but the training to be mm. able to do YouTube, which we're having like three hour training sessions. It's funny. I, I have no doubt. There's probably people watching now that think, Oh, it's YouTube. It's just to like put your zoom on and then chuck it up when you, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. You whoa. think of the editing time. I've looked at your edits and they're, uh, they're quite complex and they're, they're good. Now, um, I, if I, if I've got, silly ideas myself and thought, uh, oh, well, I'll put background pictures of this and I'll make sure my um, the part I'm speaking about lines up with this bit of uh, background animation. I thought, it slows the whole thing. You know, you've got to set aside a whole day to um, edit the thing into shape. Yeah. Even And um, the, the editing program, some of them are good, but you need a pretty powerful computer to make it run on a reasonable time length. Otherwise, you're standing at the lift waiting for the numbers to come down all the time. Fortunately, we've got the computer, but that's the minimal thing, really. I mean, that's that. You, at least you can pay money and buy that thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't buy time, and, and that's uh, what none well, of us have enough of, I suppose. The, the issue is that I, I get up anywhere between 5 and 6.30, so fairly early riser. And because sport or fitness is part of what I do, then mm. I've got to go for my run. I haven't got to. I, I love to go for my run in the morning. So I start work very early. What time do you go to bed? Uh, 
Oh, uh, well, this is the thing. I don't generally finish work till nine every night. I take oh, no. time off after my, my lad gets back from school, obviously, to spend... With him. To, yeah. to eat with him, to watch some telly, to go out and kick a ball around or whatever. Mm. But I need to put that in and work till, till probably nine or ten every single night from five, five or six in the morning just to make... I, I, just to get through your day properly. Yeah. Just to get YouTube sorted. I'm mm. not saying make any money from it then. You know, I, I'm saying just to get the videos up. And, and no, I, no, we don't make... Well, I, said, I haven't monetized mine and I, I don't think there's any hope of it. But um, I, in theory, um, whatever else we do, uh, whether it be books or, or whatever, uh, should be producing enough income so you can keep on doing what you're doing. Well, this is it, Luke. Luke's helping me out, and I'm gradually. He's he's a, becoming a wizard at editing. He he's an audio guy anyway, because he's um, mm. a guitarist in the in the the world's most popular U2 tribute band. U2. Which is, what, what's it called? U2. 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 Oh, All right, I get it. Yeah. yeah. And he does my social media, which is another. Um, well, that's nightmarish anyway i, I mean just to respond that, to comments and things oh it's just such a drain on on resources mm. and time so basically luke's doing that and the reason is i i need to move on with my life i need to be coaching speaking and doing the audio books and and writing more books and mm, mm. but it's that uh, catch 22 if you're not a millionaire you can't pay people millions of pounds to do all this stuff for you 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 have to work with what you've got not only that, then um, I've often asked Sean, how do you manage to knock out another book every uh, uh, nine months or year and a half or something? I just don't seem to be able to wedge that time in. Um, yeah, I dictate it. So when I, wherever I am, it goes straight on my phone recording thing and gets typed up. Uh, yeah, and then, I, oh, I have no know. idea how he manages to do... Oh, you? he's lost his girlfriend. <laughs> I mean, he's got no social life, um, but he's a determined sort of fellow. Mm. Um, you know, we were going to do uh, a thing on the Isle of Man, which was a talk fest thing, but um, he pulled out of that because uh, to take three days off to travel somewhere to uh, do something like that, the loss to him of output which he's committed to, to, to keep his channel up. Well, he's got 700,000 subscribers, which is good. But the demand on that is content, content, content. And when it comes to people like us and not making anything off the channel, uh, unless we, if we had 10 books out there that were doing okay, and, and you, you readers, listeners, watchers were coming in through the, um, through the YouTube channel, then okay, you start to see a living. But without 10 books, uh, it's not like we're short of an idea for uh, 10 books. Oh, I, I exactly. get them every week. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't want it to be shit, really. Uh, I'd like to be, re research something, uh, find out something more I don't know about or, or why something. And also you get kind of sick of biographical stuff after a while. There's other people and things you've come across that you think, no, there's a story in that. People would like to know about that. Um, if you get a podcast going, you'll get some advertising money for it if it's very, very popular. There are some murder mystery ones. Uh, I think Suspect was one of the first big ones. Uh, I don't know how it really works. I, I might know at the end of the week because I'm on Friday I'm recording for the Michael Anthony show, which is some kind of a podcast. I have no idea what the download numbers are. So it's going to be but, an interesting time now, David, for, for mm. podcasts and, and channels, because obviously during the, this recent fiasco, everyone was, locked, you know, under house arrest. So many people started a podcast. What, oh, what, yeah, you're right about that. Everybody they, and their dog thinks they've uh, got a YouTube yeah. channel in them or something. What, what they probably didn't realize is when you go back to work, if you think you can work full time and do a podcast, unless you're incredibly loaded and you can pay people to do everything for you, which they're then going to do pretty much second rate possibly because they don't know you and what, then you, your, your podcast is going to crash. So 
not only that, if they're hobbyists who are doing it on a whim, they can drop out you know, yeah. at a crucial moment just when you're building up the numbers. And but something. to the other side of the coin, of course, there's not so many people watching podcasts now because everyone's gone back to what to their daily lives. So lots mm. of things have dropped down for us. On the other hand, we're strong. We're still going. We're a very popular. Um, uh, yeah. Um, look, a lot of those people had no uh, real content. Uh, how depressing is it when you see some absolute half wit on TikTok with extraordinary numbers who uh, goes on for 24 seconds, uh, blows raspberries for the first 10 seconds, turns around and farts at the camera. And then he's got you know, 8 million people going, oh, I love that. <laughs> If, My yeah. grandson comes up and shows me all this shit every day. <laughs> That's the thing. I call it the satanic algorithm. If you if you put evil stuff out there, and by evil, I don't mean like dressing up and killing sheep yeah. or whatever. I mean, yeah. if you put stuff out that is just bad for young people, your statistics will go through the roof. Oh, if they get told they're not, they're not supposed to watch this, then, then they'll draw them in. Like, yeah, sure. but it's just anything that... Rep- Anything that uh, uh, triggers a narcissistic left brain, uh, you know, yeah. pleasure receptors, pleasure now. Da, 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 da. Oh, and, and of course, you're right. I see where you're getting at. The, um, the level of response that somebody growing up now would be instant gratification, instant yeah. return, uh, demanding low uh, capacity for focusing on something and taking something. I noticed with anybody who, all of the kids, you know, around within my family and whatnot, for the most part, if I try and explain to them some technicality or how a steam engine works or, or whatever it might be, I can see them drifting within 35 seconds because there hasn't been an exploding cigar. So The, the, uh, the irony here, the chat that we've just had, this chat that, that people are watching now is not just one of the greatest conversations that's ever taken place, but it's more value than anything that has ever been uploaded to TikTok ever in history. Well, that's not a very high bar to jump over, but I know what you're getting at. You know, it's true. Hmm. Watching someone dance in their underpants or whatever the hell. uh, Yeah. It triggers your brain for five seconds and then you get bored. So you watch another one and that just, Oh, 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 it's a, a sheep's gone shopping. Wow. Oh, it's a pig riding a cow. No, no, no. And, and, and not only the content, people are in denial about um, where the demographics shift up to very popular with uh, uh, 99% of guys between the ages of 18 and 31. Um, I was showing something the other day. Uh, she's funny, isn't she? She's not funny. She's a bimbo. She's cute. She's cute as hell. But that's all she's got. Uh, that's why, well, frankly, all you wankers out there are, are, are watching it. It's, um, it, it's a more, but I think um, quality content will pay off in the long run. You'll get yeah. people, um, certainly, hopefully, and it will look back upon your material and think, oh, no, I've got, a, I've got more to see here. I can go into this and, you know. I'll uh, say, what well, I should explain for our friends listening, it, it, the stuff David and I are talking about now, and I, I'm not saying we're up there with the great orators or what, 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 or, 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 or the, that what, what I mean is it's stuff like this conversation that when I was young, I would have just been all ears picking up on all the little nuances about travel and passports and, thailand and bought and i'd just be i'm gonna do that one day Mm. i am gonna i am gonna track and it was that curiosity and that interest in not just life in general but an investment in my life that got me everywhere i ever wanted to go around the planet every single place i ever wanted to go i've been i've been that's good that's uh that's why the podcast is called bought the t-shirt right Mm. And the thought that had someone introduced me to say Xbox at nine years old and, and TikTok at, at 13 years old and, and then Instagram at, at 14 or what, whatever the age is, that I would have spent, instead of having the most amazing life of adventure, 
Mm. Really being a happy, fulfilled person now that I'd still be my age playing pretend soldiers or what, yeah. you know. <laughs> oh, I know what you mean. There's a, there's a huge gulf of difference in the, the, to a life lived in a synthetic uh, simulation of one that's uh, not even real. I even put out a video once saying, it's three o'clock in the morning, what the hell are you watching this for? Get out and do something, you sad sack. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't I don't judge people. I understand it all, David. But there'll be mm. people out there that are listening now that go, do you know what, Chris? I, I, I get what you're you know, I get it. I, I we learn by experience, don't we? You can't you can lead a horse to water and all that sort of stuff. Oh, that's true. And that's true. but if but if someone listening now thinks, do you know what? Yeah. I'm not suggesting you smuggle stuff across borders, folks, but I am suggesting you want to see a bit of this planet. You want to get a backpack well, on. Well, look, okay, uh, I think the life I've lived, uh, uh, on the one hand, I wouldn't want to get so deep and dark, but on the other hand, I'd be reluctant to trade off the things I've seen and the things I've learned. Now, if somebody can vicariously suck the useful parts out of my miserable existence, uh, and gain some understanding so that when they travel, they know what they're looking for and the same from your material and your life, then it's a good thing. They haven't wasted their time. So hopefully they'll do that. Well, you know, Chris, it's been two and a half hours, I see, that yes. we've been rattling on. And the call of, not the wild, but the call of the lunch <laughs> is uh, very strong and I don't blame you. <laughs> David, it's been uh, wonderful. I'll send you this video as soon as it's... it's no, whenever. Done. Yeah, 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 that's fine. That's good. Please look after yourself. Come back and talk to us soon. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be, we, yeah, we should uh, do this a little more often because I think it was uh, must be nine months ago now or something, wasn't it? Yes. I don't know. Still. And good to see you looking healthy. Obviously, yes. you're enjoying your morning runs. Oh, I'm just as fit as I've ever been, I think, and um, mm. uh, 51 years old. I'm doing this, still doing the stuff I did at 18 in the Marines. We did a, a group of us veterans did a nine mile speed march the other day for charity. Oh, well, now we, be careful. I don't want you dropping dead from some heart attack. <laughs> I don't think I'm quite there yet, although I've got a, I've got uh, a bit of a weekend coming up, I must say. But uh, well. um all right, yes. then. Good to see you. And yes. um, uh, if anybody's got any questions, they can always ask them down below and we'll probably even get around to answering them. Sometime. Yes, we'll put all the links, both of us, below the videos, folks. So feel free to ask anything, uh, put mm. something in the, in the questions. And for everyone at home, much love. Look out okay, yourself. Then. And for me too, goodbye and see enjoy the rest. Bye. <laughs> Ding. <laughs>